Before we get into things, I just wanted to talk about the schedule. I think I showed you this uh, last week uh, where we're at. So today we're going to cover topic 19. That should be one lecture possibility. It might spill five minutes over into Wednesday's lecture. Wednesday is going to be an overview, uh, review session of um, the last uh, topics. Uh, so topics 13 to 19. Thursday, we have a special uh, extra review session. It's going to be uh, hosted by uh, Dana. She is at the um, Academic Success Center. That's formerly the Skill Center. I think she's going to pop in on Wednesday to introduce herself. And then um, the 21st is your final exam. And that's a two-hour final exam. So uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the final exam on Wednesday and just a little bit right now. So this is what the final exam is gonna look like. It is covering the whole course, but you may notice that most of the final exam is gonna be focused on topics 13 to 19. So if you take a look at my footnotes right here, the, uh, basically what I'm doing is uh, for the multiple choice questions, I'm taking about two per topic, um, give or take something like that. and. Uh, and most of the other sections um, are going to be covered. Uh, so the matching, fill in the blank, transcription, translation, long answer. Um, most of that's going to be focused on topics 13 to 19. So you want to spend most of your time focusing on topics 13 to 19. I would say out of all your study time, uh, you know, spend at least an hour, maybe flipping through your other notes and um, taking a look if there's any gaps in there. I'm not gonna be asking really specific stuff about the first few topics. Like I won't be asking you about the details of the uh, light dependent reactions and photosynthesis, but I could be asking you what are the light reactions or what is photosynthesis? Uh, you know, uh, questions around those kind of things. Um, so it will be worth your time to take a look through that. Remember one of the major themes of this course is we talked about uh, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, viruses uh, as uh, entities. So uh, that's something you sort of want to pay attention to when you do go through your notes and um, make sure you know a little bit about those things, what they are and what some of the differences are. Of course, in these last few units, translation and translation, we've talked a lot about uh, differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So it's worth your time to review those things as you make your notes and you study for the final. So on, uh, on Wednesday, I'm gonna go over this in a bit more detail, uh, show you some sample type questions and uh, do another uh, transcription translation mutation type of question as well uh, to get you ready for that final exam. So notice that that'll be about 10 marks. So you'll be transcribing, translating, answering questions about that DNA sequence. So think about some of the things that we did before asking you, where's the promoter? Uh, where's the start codon? Which strand is the sent strand? Which strand is the template strand? Uh, and then there's other questions around mutation. So what would happen if we change this G into a T? What kind of mutation would that be? Would it be a silent mutation? Um, would it be a missense mutation and so on? So I'll show you a sample question on uh, Wednesday regarding that. And there is a sample question or two uh, in the, um, the study package that I put on, on Moodle. So that's all I'm gonna say about the final exam for now. Today, I want to talk about um, Recombinant DNA technology and forensics. So uh, this unit here is almost like a bonus unit where we get to talk about some of the things that we've learned about, but uh, learn about some uh, really interesting applications around uh, these technologies. So let me talk about what these technologies are. And uh, some of these things we've seen before or I've at least mentioned. So most of this stuff should be uh, um, kind of review uh, and then the applications might be new. So let's get into this. So first I wanna talk about the DNA toolbox. So what are these tools that we're talking about? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about each of these things. And most of these things we've talked about at least a little bit already. So let me just uh, get into them. So first one I wanna talk about is PCR. I've talked about this one already as being basically a DNA replication in a tube. So if you're going to replicate DNA in a tube, and uh, rather than in a cell, remember in a cell, we need all those enzymes, we need DNA replicate, uh, replicates and helicase and all those things. Uh, to do it in a tube, this process is called uh, PCR. So you need a DNA sample, 
And I had mentioned this could be like a DNA sample from, let's say, a crime scene. Okay, so this could be a hair or some blood or something like that. Uh, you're going to need some nucleotides to make new DNA. We're going to need some primers. And we're going to need a DNA polymerase. So this is where the P for polymerase or, or PCR comes from. And chain reaction means you do something again and again and again, and then you, um, and, and, uh, you, you get DNA in the end, basically. These primers, remember that DNA polymerase cannot start on its own, so you need primers. Uh, primers, you can actually buy them synthetically. Uh, there's chemists that will do this for you. It's very cheap. In fact, I think there are machines that do them uh, nowadays. Uh, it's very simple. You can order them online. They give you the primers, and the primers are going to be specific for uh, whatever gene that you've chosen. So here is a quick test yourself question. It says, what does DNA polymerase do? Okay, so we got to think about this here, right? Uh, does it copy the sense strand? Does it copy the template strand? Um, the answer is no. It doesn't copy anything necessarily directly, right? So these ones are no. And so C and D, it says, uh, let's, let's look at E first. Does it make primers? No. To make primers, that's primase, remember? So it's going to be one of these two, C or D. So it adds nucleotides complementary to the scent strand or complementary to the template strand. Um, it turns out that the correct answer is D. That's what a template strand means. It means that this is the template that the enzyme is binding to. So just throwing some language at you to uh, review and hopefully you can remember what these things mean. So basically you throw these things into a tube. You have your DNA sample, you have the enzyme, you have some nucleotides. And uh, you throw it into a um, uh, something called a thermocycler. And the thermocycler, what it does is it heats things up. So uh, rather than having helicase, we can break these hydrogen bonds in between the two strands. And we can do that about, about 96 degrees Celsius is what you're looking at for maybe a minute or two, kind of depending on how big the DNA is. Usually let it cool down a little bit. I can't remember the exact temperatures, like 74 degrees or something like that. And the primers, these are the things I ordered uh, on the internet, and they will bind to the DNA. The enzyme comes in, and the enzyme throws in the new nucleotides, and now you have two DNA strands. So you do this again, and again, and again, and again. And uh, if you do this about 20 cycles, 30 cycles, you're getting millions of copies of DNA. So it's actually relatively simple. I could train any of you to do this in about three hours time. Uh, and uh, you know you have to be careful around uh, handling DNA and things like that, but it's just a matter of pipetting the right things into the tube and programming an instrument to go through the, uh, the heat cycles. So that's what PCR is. I'm not gonna ask you to uh, go through all the details of PCR, but know what PCR does, okay? And know a definition of it. Uh, and that's, that's what you need to know for the final exam. Very, very powerful, very, very useful technique. I think I may have showed you this slide before. What can PCR do? It's good for genetics research. It's good for forensics and paternity testing. We're gonna talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we can use it to analyze DNA of animals, uh, some things that even have been extinct. And uh, something that uh, if you've had a COVID test, um, if you've had a COVID test, it is PCR test looking for uh, uh, virus RNA molecules. Um, but there's other, other pathogens that can be um, tested for using the PCR uh, procedure. So what else is in the DNA toolbox? Uh, I also mentioned DNA sequencing was something uh, that is important. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the details of DNA sequencing. It's basically a PCR procedure that uses uh, uh, fluorescent nucleotides. And so this is what a sequence looks like. It's actually read by an instrument and it's directly reading the sequence uh, in, a, in a matter of speaking. And uh, so this is important because, well, you know, you want to verify your projects. You want to make sure you have what you think you have. If you're trying to study the gene for insulin, you can't just grab random fragments of DNA. You got to make sure you have the right gene. So hugely, hugely important. And uh, this is actually what they do with uh, the COVID test. They're they're sequencing it and they're looking and they're discovering different variants. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of uh, our investigation of this new virus. Here's a, a picture from the textbook. There's, um, I, I like showing this to people because 
Some of you may have this guy as your uh, psychology instructor. And um, actually, it's not this guy. This guy just happens to have a really common name, Michael Smith. Um, so some people get a kick out of that. But that's uh, actually uh, Michael, the, the Michael Smith who founded this lab uh, was a Canadian scientist uh, who uh, ended up with a Nobel Prize in genetics. And um, so this lab was named after him. And you can see it's a big sequencing center. So what else can we do with DNA? We can cut and paste it. I also talked about this as well. Uh, we talked about these restriction endonucleases. So, so a nuclease is something that cuts DNA or RNA. Endo means it cuts it in the middle. And uh, so for example, there's an enzyme there that recognizes that sequence AGCT. It cuts it in the middle and you end up with cut DNA. Here's another one, ECOR1. It recognizes that particular sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C. Cuts it like that. And, uh, and so we have these enzymes that are like uh, precision scissors uh, that can recognize very specific DNA sequences. So uh, who cares? Well, it's these very useful tools. So if you take a look, here's kind of a typical project where you might have a plasmid and you have a restriction site there. There's an eco R1 site and uh, you cut the plasmid. And so now you have a linearized piece of DNA. And um, so here's another piece of DNA. So maybe you want to put the gene for human insulin inside that E. coli plasmid. So what you've done is, is this has been cut with the same uh, um, restriction endonuclease. And uh, you put them together. And it turns out that you know, these little nucleotides here, they can form hydrogen bonds with complementary base pairs. So if you see here A over here, A pairs with T and T pairs with A and so on. And uh, the only problem is this is just hydrogen bonds. So the last thing we usually do is throw in a little bit of DNA ligase. So this is the same ligase that we see with DNA replication. And you make this thing here, which is called a recombinant DNA plasmid. So this is a really common technique in labs nowadays where people are uh, preserving pieces of DNA by putting them in the plasmids, growing them up in E. coli for all sorts of different purposes. And I'll talk about some of those purposes here in a minute. So other techniques, uh, we talked about uh, gel electrophoresis in the lab, uh, and this can separate out DNA and RNA uh, fragments. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the principles of this since we did cover it in the lab. There's a nice little photograph for you. And there's another picture and you can see the different DNA fragments. So this is really useful. You're double checking, you know, when you do your, your research or whatever, uh, is the DNA there? Is it the right size? And usually it's a quick and dirty test. It takes like 30 minutes to do this. And you can say, yes, I have DNA. And even by the intensity of the bands, you can see there's more DNA here and less here. Uh, the intensity of the bands kind of gives you an idea of how much uh, might be there as well. So here's uh, an application of gel electrophoresis and using restriction fragments. So remember we talked about sickle cell anemia, right? And uh, so this is a test uh, that can be used to see if somebody has, um, has that allele. So if you take a look there on the left, that is the normal wild type gene. And this normal wild type gene has these restriction sites. It has four of them in fact. So it turns out that if you have the mutant, um, the sickle cell allele, it's got three restriction sites. So what we can do is take that DNA, we can PCR it up, make some extra copies, throw it in a test tube with that restriction enzyme DDE1, and then you run a gel. And if you are wild type, you have three bands. And if you, are, uh, if you have the allele for sickle cell anemia, you're going to have two bands. And if you're a carrier, you're going to have, uh, well, you're going to have um, more bands than that. You'll have all, all of those combined. So that's a, um, an application of using these things together. Uh, you can do RNA gels. Here's an RNA gel showing uh, different RNA and different tissues. You can do uh, protein gels. This is a protein gel that I did. You can see there's the protein I was trying to isolate. It's called penicillin binding protein 2. Uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of applications around electrophoresis. I'm not going to go into all the details on this, but just wanted to show you, uh, uh, show you some hints of some other things that can be done. So here's what a typical kind of biotech project or in many cases, a research project might look like. So you have a gene of interest that you're trying to study. So you, it could be from anything. It could be from a, 
a fish, it could be from a human, it could be from another bacteria, a plant, it could be from a woolly mammoth. Uh, and you can use PCR to make copies of that gene. So what you do is you take that gene and then you use restriction enzymes to basically uh, trim out the gene of interest and, uh, and ligate that into uh, a plasmid and often E. coli is used because E. coli is a really easy organism to grow in the lab. It's very hard to grow some things in the lab. E. coli is very easy. So you can verify your work using some of these techniques that we were just talking about, gel electrophoresis and uh, hopefully sequencing just to make sure everything looks good. And then uh, often eventually, like I said, it gets put into a host organism, it could be E. coli, it could be yeast. Uh, there's a lot of different organisms that are used, but E. coli is by far the most common used. Like I said, very simple, very easy to grow up. And then what do we do? Well, E. coli grows. E. coli uses its uh, RNA polymerase and its ribosomes, and uh, it's going to express that protein or that gene of interest. And uh, so you can see there's a whole bunch of applications here that are listed in the textbook. And you can see there's some of them. And uh, I'm gonna talk about some different applications in a few minutes, but you can see here some ideas. Bacteria can be engineered to clean up oil spills. We can put pest resistance into crops. We can make uh, human medications such as human growth hormone or um, uh, medication for dissolving blood clots. So there are all sorts of applications and we're gonna get into the applications very, very shortly here. So the last technique I wanted to talk about, we have not talked about yet. Um, and it's been a lot of time explaining what is going on here. Uh, instead, I've got a quick video here for you. And again, I'm not gonna ask you to explain this on the test, but you should be aware of what it can do in terms of what is going on. So let me play this video here for you. Uh, it's very short, just a minute and a half. And um, this guy does a pretty good uh, job of kind of explaining what this CRISPR-Cas9 thing is all about. Um, it, it's been in the news like crazy, and it's a very powerful, relatively new technique, and so it's worth knowing a little bit about it. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regular... Oops, sorry. What is going on? Regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. That's why it's just called CRISPR. First discovered in bacteria, CRISPRs are like bacterial immune systems. They have two key parts, a destroyer protein, like one called Cas9, and a piece of RNA that matches viruses that previously infected the bacteria. If the same virus were to invade again, the RNA would recognize the invader's DNA, attach itself to its old enemy, and its Cas partner would slice the virus's DNA, destroying it. A few years ago, some researchers realized they could use CRISPR to edit the genome of any living organism. Here's the idea. Say I have a stretch of DNA, maybe a part of a gene I'd like to change. If I know the sequence of letters there, I can build a CRISPR that carries a matching code. Once inside the cell, CRISPR will scan the DNA until it finds that exact spot. And when it does, it slices the DNA right there. Now I have a broken gene, but it turns out I can insert a new sequence into the gap. And that makes CRISPR potentially an extremely powerful tool. CRISPR stands for... So what is the whole point about CRISPR that he was trying to, to make is that um, it's a very powerful system. And notice my note here, it says, we can edit in living cells. So all those other techniques I was telling you about before were all things that are done in test tubes. And then you have to, you know, spend time getting back in organisms and super easy to get DNA into E. coli. But uh, if you want to uh, do something to a plant or a mouse or something like that, it's really laborious. Whereas CRISPR-Cas9 uh, can be done in living cells. And uh, apparently it is quite easy and very highly precise. And uh, so this is one of these techniques that's been getting a lot of buzz and there's some pretty cool things that people are trying to do. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those projects at the end of this lecture here today. 
So part two, let's talk about some applications and implications of some biotechnology. And I've got a whole bunch of interesting things here to share with you. Uh, the textbook have, has other examples. And uh, these are just some ones that have caught my interest over the years uh, among many. So let's, uh, let's take a look and dive right in. So first part, let's talk about forensics and paternity testing and how that might work. So by forensics, by the way, we're talking about crime scene stuff. So you may have seen some of these things done in, in movies. Paternity is where you're testing to see is somebody the dad or not kind of thing, right? So forensics and paternity testing make use of something called VNTR. So sometimes it's called VNTR testing. So what is a VNTR? VNTR is a variable number tandem repeat. So it turns out there are parts of our genome um, we don't think they're coding or used for anything. We're not really sure, uh, but we have these repeats. So these little sequences of nucleotides that are repeated, um, about 10 to 100 nucleotides. And it turns out um, that there's a decent amount of variation between individuals in the human population. So some people have uh, multiples of these repeats. So some people have more multiples and so on. So if you take a look here, what they're doing is they're showing uh, in this slide, we've got uh, two individuals, right? So this is individual one right here, and this is individual two. And so if you take a look at individual one, remember individual uh, humans, we get DNA from mom and DNA from dad. Individual one has two alleles. And so this person here has allele called A5 and allele called A2. So A5, you can see has one, two, three, four, five um, uh, repl replicates or uh, uh, repeats, I guess. Allele two has two. Uh, if you look at individual two, this one has uh, three repeats and this one has four. So, so what do we do with this? Well, you can do PCR and you can run this on a gel and you can see that uh, we have differences in the bands. So here's an example of uh, six individuals and, and one allele. Remember everyone has two copies of, uh, of that gene. Uh, and, or sorry, one gene, but everyone has two alleles of that gene. And you can see amongst uh, six individuals, uh, you can actually see differences on, uh, on the gel just from looking at this one uh, small section of the genome. So this uh, process here is sometimes called DNA fingerprinting. And uh, it's used in, um, in crimes, uh, crime scenes once in a while and, and in crime shows uh, quite frequently. Uh, more often in crime shows than, than actually in real life, by the way. So if you take a look, here's another uh, example, and, and that's it's the same example of the first gene. And usually what we do is we'll look at multiple genes. The problem is if you look at one gene, um, there is a chance that people might have the same band. So let me just go back to this one here. For example, um, well, even these bands here, right? These ones here are really close maybe hard to tell what's going on there, but so it's good to have a, a better profile just to make sure that nothing by chance actually matches up. So in this case here, you can see that uh, these two individuals by chance, both of them have B2, um, but we're not just looking at B2, we're looking at the whole picture, the whole fingerprinting picture. So I'll show you some gels and, and how this might work. Um, so I, I googled um, VNTR or paternity testing or something like that, and of course, uh, what does Google tell you? It tells you you can get testing done in town for paternity, and uh, in fact, uh, this image came up here. I don't know with whether, I don't think this is in uh, town, but apparently in some places you can buy this off the shelf in the pharmacy, so that was news to me. Uh, you buy the kit and you probably send away the sample, and usually what happens is, uh, is you get a swab of, of the inside of somebody's cheek. And uh, so, you know, you might be wondering, for example, uh, in this case here, uh, is this the real dad, right? And so, you know, these are important for lawsuits and custody cases and those kind of things um, all the time. So if you take a look at this, usually what you do is you're going to test the mother uh, as a positive control because you know that the mom is going to have, uh, usually you know the mom for, for certainly, you know, um, if, if she's the correct mother or not. And then the child and then the alleged father, right? So if you take a look, in this case here, the mom's DNA, one of the band is going to match. So remember, the mom is contributing 50% of the DNA. And the other band does not match. And that's, that's fine, right? 50%. Uh, the dad is going to match the other band. And then the, this one here is not going to. So in this case here, we can say, yes, that is the father. Uh, if it wasn't the father, 
uh, the, uh, none of the bands should be matching or, or there might be one by chance. And this is why we test multiple alleles to make sure. So you can see in the same case, you've got the mom is matching uh, this band and this one here uh, does not match the father. I'll show you some actual gels here I've got. Uh, there's a gel um, that I found on, uh, on the internet. I have changed the names to protect the innocent. But if you take a look, this is a gel and they've got several uh, uh, alleles are, are looked at. And so what you're going to do when you analyze the gel is you're basically trying to look to see does 50% of the DNA match the child uh, to the mother? So, or, or sorry, to the father. So this one here, by the way, if you don't know Star Wars, this is the mom. Luke Skywalker is the child. And we have two potential dads. So we'll call them D1 and D2. So if you take a look, mom matches there and there. Uh, it's a little faint, but it matches down there. Sometimes it gets a little crowded down in this region, but it looks good. We've got about 50% of the DNA seems to be matching the mom decently, right? Um, on the dad end, uh, it looks like we've got some matches there, some matches there, some matches there, and potential father number two doesn't seem to match at all. So in this case here, we can confirm that Darth Vader is the father because 50% of the DNA does seem to match the, uh, the child. Uh, here's another uh, example. This one is from the textbook, and this is um, talking about a, um, uh, a court case that uh, this individual here, um, Earl Washington, uh, had been in jail for 17 years for um, a crime he did not commit. I, I don't know whether it was a murder or not. It looks like they're, they're looking at semen, so maybe a rape uh, slash murder. I'm not entirely sure of all the circumstances, but uh, he was able to get his lawyer to um, to take a look at the DNA evidence, right? And so if you take a look at, uh, they looked at three markers, right? So we got marker one, two, and three. And uh, so marker one, Earl had bands at these sizes, 16 and 18, marker two, 14 and 15, marker three, 11 and 12. And if you looked at the semen on the victim, there is no match here at all with that. And there was a, a second potential suspect and it turns out that they were able to get his DNA and it was, perfect match. So in that case, they were able to exonerate uh, Earl and uh, arrest Kenneth um, and because uh, they had uh, much better evidence uh, showing that uh, indeed the, uh, the second man was the, the perpetrator. So on your final exam, you are going to have one of these gels. Um, it might look something like this. I may ask you something else. Uh, maybe, you know, it'll probably make it a little bit harder. Uh, you know, maybe I will say uh, which two children belong, and then the answers will be child one and three, one and two, one and four, or something like that. Uh, but take a look at this. This gel, it says here, which child is likely not to be the offspring of, of the, uh, the father? So um, we can take a look. We have child three seems to match the father, and child four has at least one band that matches the father. Uh, child two does not look like child two as anything child one does. So correct answer is, is child two. Uh, I think last semester I did it the other way around. Um, I had uh, just the, the lanes labeled A, B, C, and D, and I said, uh, you know, which statement is true? And, and so, you know, it might say child A or, or uh, lane A is the father and child or lane B is, is the child. And so you have to look to see if it's consistent with, uh, with what it's saying. So I will have a gel like this as one question on the, on the final exam. So be prepared to see that. So if you are interested in, um, in, in law enforcement or crime or, or whatever, um, you may have heard about uh, um, the CODIS data bank. Um, this is, was actually developed by the FBI and I think it's being used worldwide now as a system. And this is for forensics and they're using 13 specific markers. So they wanna make sure there's no doubt that you would have a match by accident. Right. The only case you might have a match is if you do have a, um, a twin, right, an identical twin or triplet or something like that. Uh, in Canada, we have a national DNA database. We use the CODIS system as well. And I think Interpol is using CODIS now as well. If you're not as interested in forensics or paternity tests, uh, but you're interested in art uh, and you're looking for something super unique, I found this website here, DNA Portraits. And uh, so you can get a DNA sample sent in and they can make uh, a very nice and unique piece of art. So something you might be interested in as well. Or if, you know, you know Christmas is coming up, I'm, I'm always interested in gifts too. So let's talk about other applications of, um, 
of DNA technology. I had, I've, I think I've mentioned this one before uh, at least a few times. Uh, this is one of the oldest medical applications of biotechnology was uh, taking the gene from humans and putting it into E. coli to make human insulin. So in this case, uh, it's basic uh, uh, PCR. Um, actually in 1982, they didn't use PCR because PCR had not been invented. They had to do it the hard way, um, which I'm not gonna talk about here. But basically the second step was using those restriction enzymes and ligase and uh, making recombinant DNA. So make sure you know some of these definitions, by the way, make sure you know what recombinant DNA is. And uh, once the DNA is combined, they you can put it back in E. coli, that's the easy step. E. coli is put into a fermentation tank and um, human insulin is grown. So like I said, this is a really great uh, um, application because before they had this, you know, if you were diabetic and you needed insulin, uh, they had to slaughter animals to get it. And that was very expensive. Some people were, um, would develop allergies uh, to the animal insulin. It was, it was really um, not an ideal situation. So I want to kind of transition and talk a little bit about two things. And like I said, I want you to know definitions. The first definition I want you to know is this term here, something called transgenic. So this here, by the way, this is a joke. This is a Photoshop contest I found on the internet. There's no such thing as a banana frog. But transgenics are where you're taking DNA from two organisms and you're putting them together. So um, there's many methods for doing this, kind of depending on what you're trying to do. You can see there's an example of, um, of uh, DNA being uh, put into, uh, it looks like a, a monkey of some sort um, using a virus vector. Uh, the method doesn't really matter. We're not going to get into that. But like I said, make sure you know this term transgenic means where you're taking DNA from one organism, putting it to another organism. And I'll show you some applications of that right now. Uh, here's one application. Uh, this application is where um, scientists have taken uh, a human gene and what they've done is they put it into goats, but they put it in the way into goats in such a way that the protein for that human gene is made in the goat's milk. So why would you do that? Well, it turns out if the goat is making milk um, and you want that protein, you don't have to kill the goat. Uh, you can just milk the goat daily and then from the milk extract the protein. And so now you have this uh, kind of like a little factory. And in fact, there's a cute little name they've given these animals. They call them farm animals. So farm is a sort of a play on words because farm for pharmacy and they're making human pharmaceuticals uh, in these animals. So this example here, this is Genzyme. It's a company, I think they're in Boston and they make this uh, protein here called antithrombin-3. That's uh, an anti-blood clotting factor and uh, it is, um, it's used uh, in huge quantities in, in surgery, right? Uh, so that blood's not clotting while, while surgery is happening. So it's, it's actually quite an expensive uh, drug and they found a way to make it a little cheaper. Because previously, how did we get antithrombin-3 uh, from blood donors? And people don't give blood all the time, you know, maybe once a year if you're really ambitious, but most people don't give blood more often than that. Uh, if that, most people don't give it once a year. Um, here's uh, some transgenics or novelties. I think I mentioned these glowfish. These glowfish have uh, a gene from uh, jellyfish. And uh, now there's several species of glowfish and a whole bunch of colors. When they first came out, there were like three colors and it was all zebra fish. Um, but now there's a whole bunch of colors now. And apparently they're in Canada. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Next time I have an aquarium, I may have to look into getting myself a glowfish. Uh, some of them are art. Um, you can read about this, uh, this little fluorescent bunny here that was done. Um, I think this was Germany. I can't remember what country it was now. An artist uh, got together with a scientist and they wanted to... Uh, kind of, you know, raise questions about technology and genetic engineering and, and, uh, and made this fluorescent bunny. So you can read about that as well. Uh, there's a lot of uses for transgenic in research um, and a lot uh, of these uh, transgenic technologies are using green fluorescent proteins. So this here, by the way, green fluorescent protein, uh, GFP uh, is from jellyfish. So jellyfish are pretty cool. If you ever go to an aquarium with uh, jellyfish, they're, they're just really amazing, uh, interesting animals. And, and uh, the fluorescence adds an extra uh, dimension to the whole thing. So some scientists at Harvard made these things, they call them rainbow mice. 
Um, so what's going on here? Well, it turns out if you want to do brain research, it is not easy. And a lot of brain search research uh, involves, uh, unfortunately, euthanizing animals. Uh, how do you study the brain without killing the animal? Um, it's not an easy thing to do. So these researchers, what they did is they um, added those uh, fluorescent proteins to uh, um, uh, neurons, and uh, the neurons will actually glow when they're active. And so what they do is the, the mice have little shaved heads and they can actually look into the, into the mice's brain and watch the brain in action. Um, this is really amazing stuff. And like I said, you're not euthanizing so many animals. So that's, a, that's also a huge bonus as well. Um, there's tons and tons of examples of people using green fluorescent protein or, or other colors. Nowadays, there's a lot more colors besides green. This is a red one. Um, I found this uh, group that had developed these mice that grow uh, fluorescent tumors and uh, for studying how tumors develop for cancer research. So again, kind of sad to see the mouse uh, suffer that way, but uh, you know, this is uh, unfortunately a necessary part of understanding uh, some of these things for uh, uh, um, understanding the, the human um, diseases is uh, doing the animal research. So let's talk about genetically modified foods. So often genetically modified foods are called GMOs. So GMO actually stands for genetically modified organism. Uh, but usually when people talk about them, they are talking about foods. And uh, tons and tons of examples here. I have a handful I wanna share with you uh, and, and I'll share with you which ones are actually on the market. Um, this here, by the way, is the very first genetically modified food that came out on the market. It's called the flavor saver tomato. So it turns out that tomatoes actually have a gene inside them that causes them to spoil faster. And so what they did is they turned that gene off. And so the whole idea behind the flavor saver is you could pick it while it's red and it would make it to the, uh, to the market and, and taste so much better. I don't really know. I don't like tomatoes. Um, but apparently, when, you know, what they, what they do with tomatoes is you pick them green and they ripen on the way to the store and apparently they don't taste as good that way. Uh, so they made this tomato and it, it turns out it didn't sell. Nobody wanted to pay three times the amount for tomatoes. Um, so it was a little bit of a failure back in 1994, but it was, it was a first product and, uh, and the first of many that have, have come out over the years. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting ideas uh, in terms of, you know, we've got more than 7 billion people on the planet and we're probably going to make it up to 11 in the next 50 years or something like that. So how do we feed all these people and make them healthy and give them the right, right amount of nutrients? Uh, so this guy here um, was one of the, is one of the um, uh, leaders behind this project called Golden Rice. So you probably know a lot of people out there eat rice and a lot of it every day and it's kind of one of their staples. It turns out rice does not have a lot of vitamins in it. Um, it's mostly just starch. So he, uh, this project was like, well, you know, the rice plant, it does make vitamins in other parts of the plant. So what they did was engineer the rice plant so that it would produce uh, beta carotene uh, in the grain and rather than just the other parts of the plant. And so but it's kind of an orangey uh, yellowish color. Uh, you, you probably know it's sort of the same stuff as in carrots. And uh, so it made this golden rice. So the idea is that um, the rice itself is going to be, uh, have more nutrients in it. And, uh, and, and this is great. Um, again, a project that has had a hard time getting off uh, the ground just in terms of uh, regulatory. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are mistrusting of GMOs, uh, particularly uh, in certain parts of the world. Um, but uh, this project is slowly getting off the ground. And so uh, it's kind of interesting to see this, even though it was featured quite a few years ago now. So you're probably wondering what is off the ground? What products are out there? Um, turns out a lot. So notice this is actually old data, 2011. So 30,000 different crops. Um, it turns out the main crops are these ones here. Soybeans, cotton, and corn. These are huge, huge crops, particularly in the United States. And uh, corn and soybeans are, are used to feed livestock. And uh, so, you know, we're trying to increase yields, make them pesticide resistant and all that. And, and so um, genetic modifications can do this. And uh, I'll show you um, one, one way that, uh, that uh, genetic modification is used to a very high degree. 
So you may have heard of these things called Roundup Ready plants. So these Roundup Ready plants, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there nowadays uh, and quite a few on the market. If you talk to farmers, ask them about these uh, and they'll tell you all about them. It's actually really, really fascinating. So it turns out these plants are resistant to a pesticide called Roundup or the common name is glyphosate. So what is going on here? So it turns out what, what you're doing is you're, you're engineering the plant to be resistant to the herbicide. And then you can spray the field with that herbicide and it will kill everything, kill all the weeds and only your plant of choice is going to survive. And um, I know sometimes this is kind of backwards thinking, thinking we don't want more pesticides, we want less. But it turns out that this pesticide Roundup is actually biodegradable and, uh, and is highly effective. Uh, so in some ways, this is actually better than using the usual herbicides, which are actually a bit more nasty. Now there's, there's certainly critics. Um, there's questions as to whether it's a carcinogen, of course, uh, like everything else out there in the world. Um, but it's, it's on the market. And, and a lot of these crops here are, um, are already on the market. And uh, chances are you've, you've eaten genetically modified corn uh, or soybeans in your life in Canada, for sure. Um, there's a lot of data about this. Um, it actually turns out that GMOs have actually helped us, helped us to use less pesticides um, because we don't have to spray as much. We don't have to spray as often. And in fact, some of the crops are actually uh, um, pest resistant. So just something to think about a little bit. I, I know that um, you know, some people are skeptical of these things, but uh, they, they have actually been helping. And there's, there's actually enough data now to show that um, they're reasonably, they're, they're not more dangerous, they're not unsafe or anything like that. And uh, there are some good things going on with uh, genetically modified organisms. Some of them are just kind of things that are helping us to be convenient. Here's, here's another example, uh, apples that don't brown. Um, I don't know if I care about that. I don't eat a lot of apples, uh, but you know, uh, you're trying to make a better product. Uh, you're trying to be competitive. Uh, so I, it's not hard to imagine that this would be an issue if it's easy to tackle, then why not make apples that don't brown? Um, something that is to save the entire papaya industry. Uh, papayas um, worldwide have been suffering from, uh, I'm not sure what kind of virus, but it's been killing papaya trees. And uh, so in some places of the world, this is a really, really important crop. And uh, so they have made a transgenic virus resistant papaya and it has basically uh, saved the industry. And something like 90 something percent of papayas now are genetically uh, modified because um, that's how you get papayas now uh, because this virus has wiped out so many of them worldwide. All right, one more example of genetically modified food. I told you there were lots of examples and I just get excited when I see all these interesting things out there. Um, genetically modified salmon. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at, this is the wild type right here. And this is the genetically modified salmon. And what they've done is uh, in the genetically modified salmon, it's uh, been given an extra growth hormone. So I'm not sure whether it is a, hor a growth hormone. I think it's actually a gr growth hormone from a different species of salmon. And it allows it to grow quite a bit faster in a shorter amount of time. And these are on the shelf. I don't know if they're on the shelf in Alberta, definitely Ontario and Quebec uh, for people who buy salmon. So again, you've got, you know, we've got economic interests in all this. So I, I know that, that um, you know, this is, this is a lot to take in and it's very fast, but I, I do wanna make a point here just before I finish off today um, and show you these genetically modified uh, strawberries. So um, you're probably looking at this and thinking, so what's, what's going on here? Um, turns out these are something that most people would call wild strawberries. And this is something that you've probably seen in your grocery store shelf uh, all of your life. Um, these are not transgenic strawberries. Um, these were made through traditional breeding methods, but this one here, this is natural. This is not, this is a human invention and it is genetically modified if you look at the DNA. Um, it was just modified using traditional breeding methods. Um, let me show you some other examples here. So maybe you've eaten corn. Um, corn is a plant that cannot grow naturally. Um, the plant, has no way to propagate itself in the wild. The only way corn can grow is through humans. 
And in fact, it's been a bit of a mystery for a long time uh, where corn even came from because uh, you know, there's nothing like it in the wild. This is, turns out is the closest uh, relative of corn and we think it is the wild version of corn. It's a grain called teosinite, teosinite? I'm not sure how to say that. Um, it's a very tiny grain. It's tough to eat um, and uh, only grows in a small part of Mexico. Uh, and so somehow we believe thousands of years ago, native uh, uh, Central Americans bred this thing for hundreds of years in order for us to get to this plant. This plant here on the right is not natural. It is genetically modified. When you look at the uh, genome, it is very different. Uh, and, um, and so this is the point I'm trying to make. Um, you know, if you take a look, here's the natural on the left. Here is the artificial corn on the right. So people who are, um, are, are thinking about uh, genetic modification that we're doing in the lab, which is the, you know, the argument is we are just finding ways to, to do the process differently uh, and speed things up. And in fact, in some ways, uh, you know, rather than taking a thousand years to get uh, domestic corn, we can do this now in a, in a much shorter amount of time. Uh, and of course that old product, that grass, uh, who's gonna eat that um, compared to, you know, this nice, uh, corn on the cob that we have on the right. I'll show you one more example here of something that's, uh, you know, what the, the natural thing looks like, a natural watermelon compared to, you know, what we do grow nowadays. Uh, many varieties and uh, amazing fruit, uh, lots to them, and uh, very different taste from, from the wild thing. Uh, so, you know, like I said, this is kind of the, the question. Here, here's one more, one more, sorry. <laughs> I'm almost done for the day. I just, the, I think these things are very, very interesting. Uh, here's a plant here, uh, so bra Brassica olersia. Um, you may not recognize it, but what you may re recognize are the other versions of it. So it turns out this plant here, through artificial selection, we have made a whole bunch of different types of uh, foods. So cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, these are all the same species. And uh, like I said, you know, so what, what is natural is the question, you know, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to feed 11 billion people. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, certainly not everything is, is um, you know, the best way to go through things, uh, genetic modification, but I think there is a lot of promise and potential in these technologies. So uh, almost out of time here, I think I'm going to finish off here for today. Um, I have a few more things to talk about. So maybe, maybe about five to seven minutes of lecture, I guess I'll do on Wednesday. I want to talk a little bit about ancient DNA and I want to talk about some interesting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 projects. And, uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll do the review, but uh, I think I'll leave it uh, for there today.